thrilled to be able to gather with you in your online sanctuary. Wherever it may be that you have formed an altar in this quarantine and you've given your heart and your life to God and you've prepared that time and set that time apart to study his word and to be brought into the fellowship of his ecclesia, whether it be virtual or on campus, I'm honored and I'm, I'm weighted with the opportunity to come to you tonight with a very special word. I'm inviting you to come and lean into this word because I have something specific to share with you and to talk to you about. This is a provocative season of prophecy. This is a season that is weighted with so many uh, currents of prophecy, so many voices of prophecy. This is a season for us together, unlike any other time in our near history. After speaking with many, many pastors and leaders and after many hours of intense prayer and study and searching and inquiry and pleading with the Lord, after talking with Him and being weighted by the concerns of each of you because I carry you in my spirits and after communicating with so many of our pastors around North America, I was speaking and communicating with some of our pastors just this past week and Pastor Tony Langston shared a word with us that was a brilliant diagnostic review and and a a purview into our times. And he said something that I have to share with you tonight. He said, and I quote, we're standing as watchmen. We're prophesying against. We're issuing a clarion call to awake from the Netflix drift. And so tonight I want to spend just the next few moments on speaking to you and talking with you and communicating to you the reality of the times that we live in. We're living in a Netflix drift. The Netflix drift. Say that with me. The Netflix drift. What is that? Well, for certain, we started out strong in this quarantine. We started strong. We, we were attending church every Sunday and Wednesday, and we were shocked by the moment that uh, came to our system, if you will, the, the, the uh, systematic, the rote of living. Uh, our, our calendars, our agendas, everything was suddenly stopped and we were thrust into a quarantine atmosphere. And we went into that quarantine very strong. We were people who were alarmed. We were people that felt an urgency. We felt motivated. We were disturbed by what was going on in our society. And we were issuing a call, a clarion call to be concerned about this pandemic and all of this data that medical science was regurgitating to us very often and every hour of the day was filled with news propaganda and news issuances telling us what we needed to be concerned about until we felt as if only God could save us. And so many of those who were marshaled in prayer were praying as if only God could save us. And we were thus strong in the Lord. We started strong. We were motivated. We were involved. We are involved in our online services and we were all gathering in our online groups through Zoom and everyone was praying and gathering and talking and sharing and encouraging one another. But until we come to this place, this place where Online fatigue has set in. Many of you are weary. And we're experiencing across the landscape of our nation and North America specifically and the wider world generally, we're seeing the wholesale fatigue set in on the people of God. In fact, we've been talking about online fatigue since June. I get it. I understand it. I feel it. I I sense it. I know it. But here's the stark reality. For most people, it takes a long time to become a committed, faithful, habitual church attender and disciple of Jesus Christ. It takes a commitment and a conviction to say, I'm going to live for God. Against the wider winds that assail my ears, against the currents of life that want to carry me into the despotism and tyranny of a satanic world. I I stand as a strong voice committed to walk out a discipled life 
in Jesus Christ. And so for many of us, it takes us a while to become a fully mature believer in Jesus Christ, a follower who is committed with our life, our fortunes, and our faith. A follower who says, I will live for God despite. I will live for God instead. I will live, in, live for God in spite of all of the things that are assailing me and coming against me. And so for many of us, there's been a time where every church, every Sunday church, every Wednesday church, every small group gathering, everything we were committed to, we faithfully and dutifully serve there. And it takes us a while in God. It takes us a while in God. And God takes a while with us in patience, waiting on us to develop and develop our disciplines to worship and develop our disciplines of commitment to the church of the living God, develop our commitment to tithing and offering and serving and giving and loving and faithfully attending the works of God. It takes us a while and God has given us a while. He's been patient with us. He's long-suffering. He's cudgeling us forward. He's moving with us in grace. He has hands of mercy extended and he's walked with us and we've seen this in our lifetime develop until we're the church of Jesus Christ in the earth. But now, in one pandemic, in one moment of time, in one calendar year, I fear that the devil has had a field day with this quarantine. This quarantine has served our enemy. It has served our enemy, our adversary, the devil himself, Diablos in Greek. It, he has used this quarantine to begin to deprogram the people of God from their service in the Lord, from their service to the Lord. He's used it to deprogram us, to desensitize us, to cause us to live in a casual, let's say it's a fair, quarantine, effective in a couch of Laodicea, laying at ease in Zion, while the earth is groaning that the Lord is coming soon. It seems to me, it feels to me, that the church is being lulled to sleep in her isolation and in her loneliness. When did we get here? How did we get here? When did we first start to fade from our Zoom meetings, from our calls to prayer? When did we first fade from our online broadcast? When we started, we were dynamic and faith-filled and it was excitement-laced and raptured ready and perseverance-packed. It was on the edge of our seats. We were all gathered together. We were typing in the chat rooms. We were saying hello. We were talking to one another. We were encouraging one another. We were asking about each other. How are you doing? But now the chat rooms are virtually silent. The chat rooms are virtually empty. It is, it is a few who are faithful. I'm thinking of Brother Severson, always faithful to work and to check and to tell and to text and say how well he's doing and asking others how they're doing. It's a few. But by and large, the larger community of the church is nowhere to be found. Where are we, church? Where have we gone? What has happened to us? I'm thinking of those old patriarchs in Egypt, how they suffered through, they watched, they were wearied by the reality that there were 10 great plagues to come and we've only had one. And many of us have not been touched at all. We've been kept by the hands of God. God has been good to us. But we've been lulled to sleep because we've been enticed into a Netflix drift. Surely God's keeping his people. He's protecting his people. There is a remnant in the earth but I'm asking you tonight with a great burden. Are you a part of the family of God? Are you connected? Are you part of that remnant voice that is crying out to God? Are you walking the floor? Are you burdened for a soul? Are you hungry to see God move? Or have you been snared and captured in the mild, weak work of the enemy in this hour? I have a question for you. How can we thrive through this? That's what we started out. We started out with a great enthusiasm, 
Creativity was everywhere. We sat at tables talking about we can do this or we can do that or we can change this and we can be what God's called us to be. We're going to persevere through this. We started out with great ingenuity and great fervor. But I'm saddened to tell you that many have fallen by the way because they've not stood in the gap and they've not stayed with their voice in prayer. You've got to stand. What will it take for you to stand? What will it take for you to be called into action? What will it take to get you out of the bleachers of your quarantine and on your knees in prayer? Though you might be alone in the physical, you are not alone in the spiritual. What will it take to get you up out of the couch of Laodicea and come to an altar where you unite with brothers and sisters around the throne of God and pray an intercessory prayer, shaking the gates of hell and bombarding heaven with a prayer. Oh, I weep tonight because I see a world that is going into the very gates of hell. Their gate, the gates of hell have, has enlarged itself because there's so many that are sweltering toward the internal inferno the inferno that is going to swallow them up for eternity. And they seem to be sliding on greased rails with ease, headed to the gates of hell. Is there a church that they must climb over? Is there a church praying that they must leap over to get into the gates of hell? Oh, let it be said that we are praying. Let it be said that we are disturbed. When we started, we started strong, but will we finish strong? How you finish is more important than how you begin. Let it be said that we're standing faithfully in the end and we finish well. Paul said, I've started this race, I've run this race, and I've kept the faith, and I'm going to finish strong. And I pray tonight that you who are hearing this, may you hear the sound of a desperate watchman that is crying out for your soul. Oh, there's a great difference. There's a great difference. You can discern it. You can tell those who are mere hirelings. They're going to tell you what you want to hear. They're going to tickle your ears. But the watchman is going to tell you what you must hear. And I'm calling you now to a prayer, a place of prayer and commitment and conviction. It's high time we stand up. We stand up and gird about us the strength of God and look into the face of this quarantine and say, you will not. You will not triumph. You will not triumph over my life. You will not triumph over my life. We started strong and I'm going to finish strong. I'm getting back into this virtual world of prayer and fasting. I'm going to get back into this place where I'm talking to others and concerned about them more than I'm concerned about myself. I'm going to get back to the place where I'm lighting up the chat box with a testimony of the goodness of God. I'm going to tell everybody I know you've got to be saved in this hour. I'm going to tell them. When we started, our numbers were exploding. People were interacting and sharing. And it's surprising to see how many were impacting the wider world with their digital witness for Jesus Christ. It was wonderful to see so many of you telling everybody you knew, sharing, sharing, having watch parties, sharing so much about the Word of God. But that has waned. That has weakened. That has disappeared. So many of you are completely unplugged. How do I know? Because I carry you in my spirit and my burden is great and heavy. Fitbit is giving me badges for walking. They just served me a badge and said, I've walked the length of Africa because I've been praying for you and walking the floors at night for you. And I'm not alone. I'm not special. I'm just a, I'm just a watchman. And there are thousands of watchmen in this nation praying for a church to wake up and to realize the hour that we're living in while you're being fretted and worried and concerned about all of the things of this earth, there is an eternity that is calling you and is begging for your attention, calling you into the licensure of apostolic anointing, calling to certify you as a witness for Jesus Christ in the last day. Where are you, my brothers and sisters? Will you stand tonight and say, God, you can count on me. I will be used by you. And I will not be bored with online church. If it's the only thing I have, I'm going to celebrate it as if I were sitting on the front row in the sanctuary of God. I'm going to be involved in worship. 
whether it be virtual or on campus, whatever your limitations are, I'm asking you to plug into the kingdom of God like never before. You ought to give more than you've ever given. You ought to serve greater than you've ever served. And you ought to tell everybody you know because you have a worldwide platform to share this gospel with everybody. What will it take for you to break from this Netflix drift that has taken hold of America? What is happening right now? What is happening? What does the Netflix drift look like? What is going on? Well, at first we were getting our families up. We, were, we, we know this because we have digital testimonies of it. You have a, a digital traced history. You, we can go back and look at your timeline and see you were gathered around this, the, the television or the computer at 9 a.m. You were dressed up in your Sunday best. You were all prepared. You'd already had breakfast. You'd gotten the family up early. You made them dress up. You sat on the edge of your seat. You were watching in this online virtual sanctuary. You were sitting there. You were prepared. You were ready. You had breakfast. You were, it was as if you were continuing to do what you had always been doing, to go to church. And you were living in an excitement, in an arena. It was different. You were wanting to see what was going to happen next. You were bowing your heads. You were praying. You were in the living room. You were shouting. You were teaching your children how to pray. They were watching children's church. You were doing all kinds of things to respond to the call of God. You were chatting online. You were making comments. You were telling everybody about Jesus. You were greeting one another. You were praying with one another. You were pledging your faith for one another and you were encouraging one another. We were in the press. It was exciting. We were in a mass of people who were lifting up the name of Jesus. But after a few weeks for some and after a few months for others, we began to be gripped by a casual, carefree idea that we really don't have to get up that early and do all of that to be prepared we can go to church in our pajamas. We can go to church while we drink our coffee. In fact, we could just sleep late and not worry about 10 a.m. We'll catch it at 2. Or we'll catch it Monday. Or we'll catch it Wednesday. Or perhaps we're at a place where we're not catching it at all. We're not even watching anymore. We're not even plugged in anymore. We're not even tuned in to what's going on anymore. We're hearing the news. We're disciples of CNN they're filling us with the language of this world. They're telling us about all of their propaganda. But we have nothing, hear nothing from the troubadours of truth who are shouting from the portals of eternity. The Lord is coming back. Are you ready? Are you ready? So now we have a church that's sleeping in. We have a church that's unplugged. We have a church that's watching later. We have a church that's drifting. We have a church that's drifted from Sunday morning into Sunday afternoon. We have a church that is staring out of the window of their upper floor, looking out the window of personal choice, telling God as they blankly look into the future with no idea of what's going to happen. All the while, Satan is downstairs cleaning out, ransacking their house, cleaning out their cupboards, stealing everything from them, ransacking their soul from the disciplines of godly living and faithfulness to the house of God. Church attendance is gone. Tithing is history. Disappointment is more prevalent than anything they've had in God. Discouragement is everywhere on the landscape. Why? Because they're looking out the window of an upper story while the enemy is on the ground floor eating away at their foundation. This, my brothers and sisters, is a bold word that I've come to tell you and I've come to encourage you and I'm speaking out against you. I'm calling you. I'm calling you, Church of Champions. I'm calling you, friends of God, wherever you may be. I want to wake you up this afternoon and help you realize that God is looking for a people who are steadfast, a people who can understand the times and the seasons that we live in. This is the time to wake up and wake up loudly, wake up with a shout, with a voice of triumph. This is the time. And the only way we're going to wake up is if we hear the call to remember. We must hear what we must hear is a call to remember. 
When we remember the first call we hear is the call of repentance. It's high time for some of you to shake yourself and repent. <laughs> repent, 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 repent. The first thing we do is repent. Come to God with repentance. Repent. Well, you say, what do I repent? Oh, I, I don't feel like I need to repent for anything. Well, I'm going to give you something. Hebrews, the 10th chapter and 25th verse says, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So let me ask you a question. Have you been exhorting one another? Have you been plugged in online? Have you been talking in the chat room? Have you been encouraging someone? Have you been disconnected and not available and not seen and not heard from? Here it is. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. It's time for us to rise up and plant our feet in the solid ground of God's word and will for our life. I'm encouraging brothers and sisters. I'm encouraging. I'm, in, I, I'm, I'm calling you to stand up. Not to give in. Make up your mind. I will not surrender. I will not give up. I will not bow to a corona crown. You need to go back and watch one of the very first services we broadcast, one of the very first Wednesday night Bible studies I did. I did on the Corona Crown. And you need to go back and get that link in this message. There's going to be a link put up for you to the YouTube message that I spoke about. I taught about it from the Hebrew about Corona and the Corona Crown. And the Corona Crown has come to march across the landscape of this earth. And he's called for your allegiance and he's called for your loyalty and he's called for your worship. And will you bow? Will you bow? Or will you tell coronavirus, you're not taking any more of my heart's territory? Corona, I made up my mind. You're not stealing one more thing from me in this quarantine. Because in this quarantine, I'm going to find my consecration. In this quarantine, I'm going to become reckless with my faith. In this quarantine, I'm going to believe God for greater things. In this quarantine, I'm going to recover my spiritual fervency. In this quarantine, I'm going to calibrate my vision. I'm going to see God call my life. I'm going to hear the word of God that he has for me and he has put upon my life. In this quarantine, I'm going to tell coronavirus, you cannot have my kids. Mm. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you have allowed the quarantine to corrupt your children and try to steal your marriage. You better wake up and hear what I'm telling you right now in the Holy Ghost. You better stand up in your spirit and plead the blood around your house and tell coronavirus he's not taking your family and he's not taking your bride. He's not having your children. He's not consuming your teenagers. He's not destroying your marriage vow. He's not corrupting your victory. He's not going to have your joy. Coronavirus, it's over because I'm going to pray my way into the victory that God has already secured for me. You see, the, next, the Netflix drift is this, and it's caused many of us to see this. Netflix has replaced prayer. Netflix has replaced worship. Netflix has replaced Bible reading and Bible study. Netflix has replaced family time and relationships. Or it could be Amazon or Hulu or Prime Time or whatever it may be. But other things have replaced the will, the work, and the word of God. So it's high time for us to repent. Don't you agree? Elder, don't you agree with me? Beloved brother or sister, don't you agree? Friend of God, do you not agree that it's time for the church corporately to come to our knees in prayer and to recalibrate. Say, God, recalibrate me. Get my footing back near to the old rugged cross. Get me back to the place where I can look through the prism of my life and see that old rugged beam hanging over every promise of the divine. Get me back to see that I'm standing under the fount of blood that flows freely from Calvary's hill. Get me back. I need a reset. I need a renewal. I need a revival. Oh, God, America needs a reset. We need a revival. We need a revolution. We need to turn completely around and say, God, you are our salvation. 
I don't want you to have a reset because you hear one service because it's not going to be one service. It's not going to be from one message that I preach. It's not going to be from one message or teaching that you receive. It's not going to be because of some great personality that walks across the landscape of your life. I'm talking about a reset in your spirit where you become a true disciple of Jesus Christ again and you are walking without fear and you're walking into favor. You choose to disciple yourself and you prove to God that you will be a disciple because you discipline yourself and you do what you must do to keep the home fire burning. And this is the message that you must have. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to hear the call. I'm going to reset. I'm going to commit my life. I'm going to see the great danger in a quarantine. I'm going to see what happens to men in the peril of isolation. I rebuke it in Jesus' name, and I'm going to stand up against the quarantine that has been treating my family to isolation. I rebuke it, and I demand that the Spirit of God invade this quarter and seal me with the signal of His love until I become what he wants me to be in a new normal. I've got a question for you in closing. What will your life look like if this goes on until March or April of next year? What will you look like? Where will your faith level be? What will you believe then? How much disappointment will you carry upon the shoulders that once laden the presence and power of God. The staves of the ark that once rested upon your shoulders now have been vacated and only emptied for the burdens of depression and despair. What will happen to you in March or April if you've not been connected to the house of God at all and you've lost all disciplines of godly living? Where will you be? Will we be preaching your spiritual funeral? I pray not. I'm so burdened for some who've so easily been taken away. Called me and told me, Pastor, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. Things didn't turn out like I thought they would. And so I'm just going to step back. I'm not going to give tithing anymore. I'm not going to come to church anymore. I'm, not going to, I'm just going to watch a while and see what happens. Your commitment. It's not to a man. It's not to a building. It's being read by God himself. And I love you. And I'm calling for you. And I'm reaching for you. And I'm pleading God for you. I want to see you saved more than anything in this world. Don't be taken by one pandemic. One plague that has wiped it's hand across the entire world. And that's the reason we know that this is an end time signal. This is the first pandemic that has touched all the world at one time. This is an end time signal. The heavens are sh shouting that the Lord's coming back. The earth is groaning that the Lord's coming back. Pandemics are telling us that the Lord's coming back. Every kingdom in the earth is shaking and the Lord is coming back. The preachers who are men of God, who are watchmen on the wall, are screaming into your spirit, the Lord is coming back. And what will it be? A flip of the channel? Reaching for someone who will entertain you and tickle your ears and tell you how good you can have it? Or will you hear a God-sent voice that says, watch for the drift. I'll never forget. I'll never forget when I was a youngster, standing on the icy cliffs of that glacier, hearing the groanings of that frigid climb declare there is shifting in the ice. There's a seismic shift going on at any moment. Large, large portions of that icy glacier would crash and crumble and fall into the sea, disturbing the waters. Those placid waters would begin to erupt with the praises of their reception of that large body of ice. Everywhere, the thunder of the seismic shift could be heard. Nature was, was screaming and shouting that the ice is plummeting, the shift is coming. It is taking 
us. Every time you see on the news a, a, a waterfall or you see the earth moving its deposits, you hear the shifts of nature. Sadly, some of you have been captivated by the placid waters of culture. All while an enemy has been shifting your foundation and you've not heard a sound and you've not seen a thing. So this weekend, I'm going to ask you, do you see what I see? And I'm going to be speaking to you from the plains of Migdali Dar, just outside of Bethlehem. A Savior was born. But did you see and do you see what the shepherd saw? I promise you, now's the time to hear and to see. And if you will, you'll hear the call. You'll repent of your position. You'll change the velocity of your prayer. And you will aim for the throne room of God and be saved. I love you. I praise God for you. We're in the end time. We're in the end time. And here's three things. I want you to write this down with me. If you're, if you're new to this or perhaps you're studying the word of God, study Revelation 6, 15, 16, 15. Uh, study the words of Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day or the night or the hour that the Lord's coming. Luke 21, 34 through 36. Watch, 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 watch yourselves, watch yourselves, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down and carried away, dissipating with the things of this life. You cannot live, brothers and sisters, without accountability. The spirituality that God has for you is made for ecclesia. It's made for the gathering. It's made for the body. You cannot be a member independently. You must be connected. And so here's some things that we can do together. Here's some things that we can do together in this season of pandemic and quarantine and isolation. Here's the things you can do to prove that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ and to be a good steward of the grace of God that's in your life. Host a watch party. Be faithful. Be deliberate. Attend online services. Tell somebody you're in the house. Tell others how much you love them. Be a part of the body. Interact with the body. Share this message with the body. Share it everywhere you go. Keep the Lord's day the Lord's day. Get up and get dressed and go to the house of the Lord, even if it be a virtual highway. Go to the house of the Lord. Be a part of a small group. Be a part of a community. Be a part of a team. Get in the dream team. Serve, whether it be socially, virtually, or on campus. Make sure you're a part of a small group that's interacting and doing life together. Be a part of our care facilitator team. Be a part of going and sharing with somebody. Be a part of our prayer team. They're praying night and day. People are calling in for prayer from all over the world. And we're lifting up those prayer request. Be a part of the community of God. And then finally, be part of personal evangelism and be faithful with your tithing and offerings. Don't unplug. Don't unplug from the benevolence of God and the favor of God and the kingdom and the order of God, the government of God. Why would you unplug from the very thing that blesses you? Because you're disappointed? Because you want to quit? Oh, if this can say, shake you, you, sure, sure, you shall surely be shaken. But I call you to stand because you are a troubadour and God equipped you to be an overcomer. This is nothing. You can defeat it and you can do it because you have this right here. And the spirit of this letter lives in you by the power of the Holy Ghost. So would you pray with me now? Would you pray with me now? And would you say, Lord, I'm coming back with the fervor of a first love disciple. Recapture your first love. Recapture your first love. Hear the angel of Revelation say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You recaptured your first love. It might have waned, but you got it back because you claimed the reset that God has for you. And you've recalibrated your vision to see him high and lift it up and his train filling the temple. Lord, we're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed with your goodness and your love for us. 
We thank you for your word. And we thank you for loving every child of God. We love your people. We are burdened for your people. I long to see your people. We've been set apart so long. And I yearn to be with them. To hear their voices and praise and adoration. To hear their hallelujahs. But until then, Lord, I pray that you keep them. I pray that you invest all of your glory into their life. Heal them. Assuage their fears. I count it joy to hear that they have deliberately turned and reinvested their passions in your kingdom. That they serve you with boldness. They serve you with glad tidings of great joy. They serve you, Lord, because they found you to be Messiah, Lord. I praise you that you're a healer. I praise you that you've given us the Holy Spirit of the living God. And I praise you that you touch all of our families and reclaim their hearts for your throne. Make their heart your throne room and fill that throne room with your fire. In Jesus' name we pray. And I pray for every one of you to be healed and to know the love of God. I love you. God bless you.